Hello everybody, welcome to the Boxing Science Podcast. This is the third and final instalment of our mini-series of the roundtable discussion that we had about sports-specific strength and conditioning in boxing. In this episode, we're going to be talking about sports-specific fitness. So how does high-intensity interval training meet the demands of boxing training and competition? Mainly we're going to be talking to Dr. Alan Ruddock. He's going to be sharing some nuggets of experience, research and training application on how we've implemented high-intensity interval training from a general point of view and also met specific demands and working with different fighters and working towards different fighting styles and different tactics that they want to employ on fight night. If you haven't checked out the other parts of the uh, roundtable discussion, suggest you do so. You don't have to do it in any particular order. But the first episode is on exercise selection of strength training and how we link up the physical to the technical demands of a fast and forceful punch. And then episode two looks at how a strength creating coach adapts their practices during a training camp. And then we bring on ourselves on to episode three, which no further ado, let's have a listen to what Dr. Alan Ruddock has to say about high intensity interval training in boxing. I'm going to move on to um, fitness now. So this is where we're tapping into the brain of Dr. Alan Ruddock. So with boxing, of course, we're like kind of we're battling against the old traditions of long, steady state runs. Um, you know, more like going towards like kind of the high intensity interval training now. And I think we're in a much better place compared to where we were five, six, ten years ago. Yeah. But in terms of high intensity interval training, you know, a, a question that we get quite often: Why don't we just do three minutes on, one minute off? Why don't we meet them time motion and and kind of rest work to rest ratios that uh, um, that our boxers do in competition and in training as well. So what are the benefits of, of moving away from that and why are the reasons why we don't just do three minutes on, one minute off? No, um, this happens in all sectors, all areas, not, not just in, in sports science, but as, uh, especially in S&C and in training and in some respect in physiology as well, is that we've got a million and one definitions for stuff and nobody's consistent with terminology or nomenclature and that causes confusion to start with real confusion because we don't know what one term means over the other like take threshold can be interpreted in 80 different ways and high intensity interval training can be interpreted in several different ways as well all you've got to do is, is look on your instagram search to see people on there doing so-called hit and it also doesn't help when we get tv shows um with michael mosley promoting hit at home um and these seven minute hit hit programs and stuff like that and i'm and i'm not i'm not having a go at those kind of exercises and sessions and things like that they're, they're completely fine for most people but what they're definitely not is high intensity interval training sessions okay and there are several components to high intensity interval training as well there, there are different different types of of ways in which we can break it down so we can break it down by mostly by time duration which then influences the intensity and then off the back of that, we can look at that chronic stimulus um, on the backdrop of an acute physiological stimulus and work out what physiological targets we're getting after in that particular session. So, for example, high intensity interval training, you can split straight away into long hit and short hit. Okay, you can, you can combine it again and have a hybrid hit session. Okay, so when we think about hit, we've got a key word in there, and that's intensity. And defining what high intensity is. 
Now, more often than not, we define it as an intensity of an RPE over seven on the CR10 scale. So that's, we use, we use something called Foster's Modified CR10 scale, category ratio scale, which is a, a Borg scale, just modified slightly for, for, for sports scientists. And we would define HIT as anything over a seven out of 10, okay? We can also go a little bit faster, a little bit harder, and we can look at HIT from a nine out of 10 perspective, which is what we usually do. And that generally corresponds to a heart rate of about 90% heart rate max. So we would generally describe in, in the work that, that we do more often than not, the intensity of a hit session of nine out of 10. Now, what we're doing there is we are anchoring intensity and we're also anchoring duration. Now that intensity and duration can be manipulated so that we're applying similar effort, but over a different time duration. And we can, like I said, we can make interval training sessions short hit, we can make it long hit, but we can also make it sprint interval training. We can also turn it into muscle buffer training. We can also make speed endurance training. And all of a sudden you can see how that umbrella term of high intensity interval training has been split into four or five different ways, okay? Depending upon the definition. So I think it's really important, first of all, that we all work on a clear definition of what high intensity interval training is because the purpose of it is to enable us to manipulate the duration and the time for us to achieve a certain physiological adaptation because that's the key to underpinning performance. Now, we take a more general rather than specific approach in our conditioning protocols because what we're trying to influence is the mechanisms, the physiological mechanisms that underpin performance, okay? And we let sports-specific conditioning, whether that's sports-specific uh, drills on the bags, on the pads, uh, or whether that's more intense sparring, take, take care of that specific aspect of conditioning that you can only replicate, and Danny and I touched on this on the last podcast, you can only replicate Tommy touched on it as well earlier, from the activity, from the sport, okay? And we have an opportunity as sport scientists to work on factors that underpin that activity, work under the hood, you know, and try and unpick performance and, and control what we can control. So we tend to train the adaptation, not the exercise. Because each session, like Danny said at the start of the podcast as well, even in exercise selection, even in the weights room, we have reasons and purposes and very clear rationale for why we have selected a particular exercise. We have the same in conditioning, exactly the same. What is the physiological adaptation that we are trying to target with this particular session? What demand does it place on the athlete acutely? What demand does it place upon them? chronically in order for us to achieve our conditioning goals with respect to the strengths and areas for improvements of our particular athlete in context of their ability to perform in their sport so we don't take a specific exercise or session like why don't why don't you just do loads of three three minute intervals because that's too specific to what we're trying to do in fact would sit in what we would call no man's land. Okay, so for example, if we were doing a high intensity interval training session and that goal was to uh, increase or um, spend 10, 12 minutes um, above 90% heart rate max, then three minutes would probably only give us around about 90 seconds above heart rate max before we'd have a recovery interval and we'd go again um, and so we'd have to keep repeating that over and over and over and over again whereas we can optimize that cardio respiratory stimulus if we just extend that out by one minute mm -hmm. 
or if we extend it out by two minutes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or we split the session up. And what we're trying to do is is extend that time at ninety percent or close to maximum aerobic capacity to then place the strain on the cardiovascular system, which then ultimately enables us to adapt chronically. So the reason why we don't go specific is, because, especially with something like a three by three, is that you can't really run fast enough and you can't really spend enough time close to the red zone before then you have to have a little bit of a rest and, and, and recover again. And it's much better for us if we can choose a session that will enable us to consistently achieve our physiological goals for that session. So two, two components to that answer. The first being we need to be really clear on the definitions of what we mean by high intensity interval training and the different ways in which we can split and slice it up to achieve our physiological goal. And relating to that physiological goal is whether or not we want to be general in our approach or more, or more specific in our approach relating to the time motion demands. Now, if you think about what the, what the boxers do in practice anyway, they'll be working off three minute rounds, unless you're in Floyd Mayweather's gym where they work off five minute rounds of one minute recovery. So more often than not, we've got the opportunity to work on the physiological adaptations under the hood and in sport specific uh, settings, got an opportunity to realize that um, adaptation that we've induced through conditioning. Fantastic, Al. Fantastic overview there. Um, we're talking like that we would probably go more general, but we do actually adapt our general adaptations to specific situations so how can these kind of methods be adapted to, to a particular fighter or tactics an example that i'm going to kind of move you towards is like the, how we'd train someone like jordan gill mm -hmm. differently to someone like gavin or jamie mcdonnell you know uh, jordan being a high intensity athlete is is, is fast is explosive whereas like jamie and gavin are more workhorse like uh, more likely to go around, go the the twelve round distance. How would we adapt our training methods uh, for them? Yeah. So initially, so Gavin. So just a bit of if you're not familiar with um, Gavin or Jamie, when they came to us, um, they were what about 30, 31? thirty thirty one. Yeah, thirty or thirty one. Okay, and Jamie had been uh, been pro for about ten years. Um, Gav probably about five years something like that and in their training history they'd um, gone on a lot of road runs okay and those road runs range from minimum 5k all the probably way up to about 20k okay at just going at intensity that they got a sweat on okay so they they felt they were working hard but not too hard, uh, and it was kind of in this no man's land um, kind of intensity domain. And over time, um, this created this endurance phenotype. Okay, so they look like endurance athletes. They're very long. Uh, they've got long arms, long legs. They're very lean, look a bit like my pencil. Um, and they're just very good endurance athletes. Cardiovascularly, very well adapted. Um, I've seen Jamie post um, a few days ago. I don't know whether this is true or not, but he's not the best, well conditioned, not the most conditioned at this moment in time. And he's, he's just gone out and breezed the sub 20 minute 5K or something like that, if, if not close to 18 minutes, it were. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw that. He's, uh, you know, he's much heavier than he normally is, um, yeah. not training as much, and he, he just went out and smashed it. <laughs> 19 minute 5k unbelievable so you know these the, the the training history of these two guys is very much uh endurance dominated and you can see those endurance tactics within within the their fights as well they're pretty much always go 12 rounds very little knockouts um and that's the way they that's the way they box it's, it's just, just ingrained now, we initially tried to get Gavin Jamie to 
sprint fast, do sprint interval training on the curve. And it just wasn't working. We did it. We did a camp where we, we put them through our, um, not, not generic because it was specific to them, but through what we thought would be the best approach for them to get them fitter, faster, stronger. And they weren't adapting to it in the way that, that we expected. Um, so quite quickly we learned we needed to change tact and change our, our focus from our reliance on more explosive type conditioning to more hit, long hit type yeah. endurance. To just give uh, some, some data there for a bit of perspective, we'd expect Jamie or Gav to be, be able to do like two minute intervals on the curve easily at 18 kilometers an hour mm. and on the 30 second max out sprint so we're really wanting to push them to high intensities they're waiting about max of 23 24 kilometers an hour so that increase in in intensity wasn't sufficient to to promote them adaptations so uh, an example would be like jordan would probably be able to do two minutes on around about 17 but on his 30 second max out sprints he'd be able to hit 28 29 kilometers an hour for the max speed so that's to just give you a little bit of perspective of that. Yeah, and, that, and like I said throughout, this intensity is really important. So we decided to focus very much on longer hit and spending more time in the red zone with Jamie and Gav. So their intervals, instead of being shorter, anywhere from one minute to um, four minutes, they go from four minutes up to eight minutes and spend as much time as they could in the red zone at much longer hits, uh, much, much longer uh, intervals. Now, Jordan, on the other hand, is much more explosive. And if you think of Jamie and Gav more like a 10K runner, Jordan's more like a 400-meter, 800-meter runner. And although he has done longer hit before, and that is part of his program, his focus is very much on shorter hit. And that, that is hit intervals of four minutes and, and shorter and clustered. So that might be two on, one off, two on, or, or, or four on, or 30 30s, 30 15, 2010s, that, that, kind of, uh, that kind of domain where we're challenging him to run at high intensities, so that might be greater than 18 kilometers per hour, 20 kilometers per hour, but repeatedly, because he's that type of athlete, he's that explosive athlete. He feels great when he's uh, training in that domain and he can see the adaptations. And that's the way he fights as well. He's very explosive, he works in, in bursts, um, and we've seen that multiple times throughout his fights now, how that mirrors his approach. So Jamie and Gav, they have a very much an endurance-based uh, focus in their training because that's the way they fight. Same with Jordan. He's very explosive, works in bursts, and that's the way we, we train him as well in, in terms of his conditioning. So I'll always say we don't really take a sport-specific approach from like a three-minute on, one-minute off. We do take into account the individual strengths of a particular athlete. And importantly, we try to make those strengths into what we would call super strengths and make them super dominant in that aspect of their performance and physiology. Absolutely. One thing that I'd say about like Jordan, more kind of explosive fighters, it's very likely that they're going to have their opponent wobbled at some point and have to go for a TKO and they need to be able to keep that sustained attack up. So they need to be able to be able to work at high lactates and be able to control them at that lactate accumulation as well. Uh, the final point that I've got written here, uh, Alan, is when we have gone, we have gone really specific before with an athlete that is like very, very well uh, rounded and well adapted to conditioning training. So uh, Kid Galahad, he was on fighting Josh Warrington, twenty nineteen. So I'm trying to work out how long it'd been like kind of doing uh, training with you for probably yeah. seven seven years. So, so, yeah, so we've gone really, we, you know, you had that, that training base to be able to go really specific with him. 
Yep. So you, you created some sort of like kind of pacing profile. What were the kind of thoughts behind that? And, uh, you know, what, what were the kind of pacing profiles that you put in place? Um, so one of the, one of the strengths of Kid Galahad, again, is his aerobic capabilities, much like Jamie and Gav. And quite early on when I was working with him, I recognized that he did everything, whether he, whether he knew it or not, he would revert back to using his aerobic energy system to get him through the session, whether he was asking me for, for more recovery or to lower the intensity, for example. And he's very aerobically dominant. Um, but where he, he's not as strong is that, like I say, that, that when he's got an athlete wobbled, uh, when he's got a boxer wobbled, and someone like, he's not very good at going in for the, for the kill and, then, and finishing um, guys off, or historically he, he hasn't been anyway, and being able to put on those burners and, and uh, really finish someone off. So one of the things that I started working on with him was that ability to, to buffer uh, acidosis, to unlock that capability for him to use his anaerobic glycolytic system to produce a lot of force in a short space of time and go in for that kill. And so we started working that um, over a, a long period of time. And he's got, he had got to a position where he was well adapted in that area now and probably more so than his aerobic energy system. And so what we did was we took the muscle buffer sessions that we'd been working on over the past few years and applied it in a very specific context. So we were doing sessions like, I don't know if anyone's seen the, the sharp shooter session uh, that we've, we've done on red zone running. It's basically a two minute interval clustered in um, different ways. So there's a two minute intervals, one minute intervals, but with only 15 second rest, it's four times 30 seconds, but with a, a 15 second rest. Um, and then we repeat that throughout, throughout sets. So we were working on working through the gears, mm -hmm. but maintaining that level of acidosis to work on his muscle buffer system. And then I would merge in these, uh, these intervals together so that he was then undulating his intensity throughout a, a, a block of time. Let's, let's say, for example, a, a four-minute block. And what I was asking him to do was spike his intensities and run. This was on the curve, by the way. And run for a period of time, 10, 10 seconds or so, let, let's say. Um, within the interval, spike it, hold it, and then come back down and recover. And he would have a baseline lev speed for recovery within the session. And then he would work above. And I chose to do this because if you look at, and we did some performance analysis on Josh Warrington, Josh Warrington works on those undulating patterns of activity. Whereas Kid Galahad is quite stable in his activity, whereas Warrington is up and down. Ooh. What we wanted to do was for Barry to outwork him when he stepped it up. So there were accelerations worked really well on the curve. So we were spiking his activity to counteract a theoretical Josh Warrington attack, then hold that activity. So it's a bit like um, a, a counterattack, so an attack over the top, and then for him to hold a high level of activity and then spike again. So if Warrington had attacked, Barry would be able to re react to that come over the top and, and react to him, then hold his base level intensity, which we expected to be above Warrington, and then attack again when he wasn't expecting it. So it was very much a variable pacing profile throughout, um, throughout an interval. So that was, that was a really specific way of conditioning, but it was underpinned by the physiological adaptation that we're going to induce at that particular point in time. So the sessions were all wrapped up in a physiological goal, but the set, but the, the manipulation of the time and intensity was, was there, um, was dependent upon the particular opponent and that strategy that we thought he would apply. 
That's fantastic. Oh, really, really good insight. And we're, it's a little bit like the punch specific work was even though we're, we're translating it to a very specific goal of improving punch power, we're still working towards the, that general adaptation, increasing the rate of force development and being able to transmit that in a punch specific action. What you're doing there is still working towards the physiological adaptation whilst working on very specific kind of time motion demands, uh, what that box is wanting to achieve. And with that, we, you know, when an athlete kind of gets into the situation where it's, it's struggling, kind of stepping up and down the gears, up and down the gears, psychologically, they know that they're conditioned for that. Yeah. So if he hadn't done that training and, and Warrington were pushing, off, uh, pushing up and he was struggling and finding it hard, he'd be thinking, I'm prepared for this. Whereas, like, because he's done all that training, it's like, yeah, this is this is what I'm used to, but I'm able to match him because I've prepared for it. It's, we're going back to to Jordan Gill that uh, that slide. If you've been on one of our courses, you'll have seen our slide where we use the the one minute assault of of Jordan, where basically it was going for technical knockout against Ryan Doyle in round four, and you know he wobbled him a few times. He had him up against, I thought the referee was going to step in, and I think Jordan did. And he he, had, he upped his like kind of intensity. I forgot the figures here. Yeah. But he upped his intensity about 60, 70, 80% or something like that in terms of punches thrown and punches landed within that minute. So his yeah. rate of punches went up massively, a massive spike. And then he said after that, his legs were totally shot. He like, he won, what, what? an athlete would use the term of punching the self out. Yeah. And, but then he had a minute break. He went back. He didn't panic because he knew that his body was conditioned, ready for that. Cause we we're doing the 20 seconds on 20 off 20 on again, the max out effort sprints we're using the muscle buffering training, going through the gears and work, being able to control them lactate, high lactates. He knew that his, if he gave himself a little bit of a rest, that he'd be able to go again. Whereas a lot of athletes would be thinking, what is this? What is this feeling in my arms? What is this feeling in my legs? I've totally gone here. Um, I'm, I'm going to panic mode and that can have a massive impact on your performance in the fight. So it's great that you're, you know, that we're talking about this kind of general versus specific and improving confidence across a range of different factors here. Yeah, I'll just give you um, an example from um, the first phase of his training. Um, so it was it, we we started off in a, a, a delivery phase. So we were doing four by four minutes on the on the curve, but the first minute he was doing a fast start at around about sixteen and a half to seventeen kilometers per hour. Then he was controlling that speed. At around about 14 and a half kilometers per hour. Then halfway through the interval, which is the weakest part of the interval, um, if you looked at a pacing profile before, that is the the nadir um, in the in the pacing profile. I was asking him to spike, um, and in my notes it's it spike. And so he would increase the speed again to 16.5 then come back and control for another minute. And then at the end of the four minutes, spike again. And his average speed for that particular interval and that particular um, session was 15.3 kilometers per hour. But you can see how it undulated throughout. And then in, in phase two, we went on, uh, we used muscle buffering. So we're using sharpshooters, reverse, reverse sharpshooters in there. And then the final phase was on um, speed endurance, training and they were around 60 seconds in duration where he was doing either a, a a controlled start and then a fast finish or a fast start and a controlled finish um just to really unlock that ability to to jump uh, on warrington if if that opportunity presented itself so that brings us to the end of the episode and the end of the three-part mini-series on sports-specific strength conditioning in boxing. 
Hopefully you've taken a lot from it and you can start applying some of these practices with your boxers uh, into your own training or if you're working in a, a range of sports you can start applying that into your approach with a, a range of different athletes. If you haven't gone and checked out the other episodes yet I suggest that you do so. We've got some fantastic discussions that take place and also we've got a range of different uh, topics that we discuss during our main Boxing Science podcast episodes and our Q&A sessions. So please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of our future episodes. And if you like and appreciate this content, please give us a rating, uh, hopefully five stars, as this will help the growth of the podcast so we can give you more high quality content on a more regular basis. So subscribe, review, share it with your friends and hopefully we'll see you on the next podcast. Cheers guys, see you soon.